may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to leave the roadway, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to leave the roadway, you will be placed... Well, Dave, for the second time just this week alone, it is another day of anger and grief after the latest shooting death of a black male at the hands of police. The killings all the more shocking and vivid thanks to social media. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional crimes. Since you have refused to leave the roadway, you will be placed under arrest on the charge of disorderly conduct. If you do not cooperate and accompany the arresting officer to the prisoner transport vehicle, or if you resist arrest, you may be charged with additional... Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to uh, National Geographic. Um, it's an honor to be able to share my work with you today. Um, and what you have just watched was an excerpt from a collection of footage that I've gathered while documenting the immediate uh, reactions and actions of protest from the public after news broke about the unjust police shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Shootings that happened just one day after each other in July of 2016. I was in New York City finishing up a section of Come to Selfhood. Uh, and while sitting for an interview with Lyle Ashton Harris, this news broke. And then we immediately saw the streets overflow in, in protest. And so I left and I participated. And Lyle sent me a text saying, remember, self-care. Back in 2012, following the murder of Trayvon Martin, I started to think about the perceptions of African Americans. Uh, specifically young African-American men. Trayvon's murder was a moment that changed my generation's notions of freedom here in America. I distinctly remember the conversation surrounding the black male and surrounding the black hoodie that he was wearing. And I thought to myself, why are black men perceived as a threat no matter what they do? I began to question the role that imagery plays in shaping uh, the ideas of the black man. And then furthermore, I thought about, well, who controls this image? And so before we dive into Come to Selfhood, I want to show you some photographs that I created in the past five years or so, uh, images from the in-between, images uh, that I made in between large projects during certain happenings, uh, or maybe just when I would experience what's called the decisive moment. One would assume that the young man in this image is being arrested for a crime and would probably be labeled a thug, a term that we hear too much about black men in America. But what you don't know about this image is that this man was unjustly de detained at a peaceful protest against the coup Klux Klan in Columbia, South Carolina. This group that thrives and operates off the hate of African Americans is still allowed to gather and terrorize. Yet this man was not allowed to protest against them. 
And so when we, when we view this image, do we begin to check our snap judgments and stereotypes? I explored self-expression And during cultural celebrations, such as Carnival and Martinique, looking at uh, the continuation of traditions and dancing and partying and ideas of freedom of self, simply challenging the norm, simply challenging uh, forms of dress, if only just for one week, for a moment of release. And so I continue to ask myself who it can indeed controls the conversation around these images and the conversation around black men in the media. Last month, I was home in December 2018 in my hometown, Rochester, New York, to continue my project, Come to Selfhood. And yes, I'm from Rochester, New York, you know, the, the, the land of Kodak. My grandparents worked for Kodak for most of their lives. Uh, and I believe at a young age, that's when photography was instilled in me. But anyways, when my brother and I were, were young, when we were children, my older brother used to do the Frederick Douglass Memorial Speech Arts Competition. And this is where young school-age children will deliver one of Frederick Douglass's speeches. And he won a few of these speech competitions. And it was such a proud moment for our family. And of course, I genuinely know how important it was now that I'm older. I realized that Frederick Douglass is a hero and a role model in the black community. And so in 2018, it was so shocking for me to learn that when I came home, which was actually 10 years after I left, after I graduated from high school, came home 10 years later, and within the first week that I arrived home, the monument to Frederick Douglass was stolen by white students from St. John's. But not only stolen, but it was stolen during the 200th anniversary celebration of Frederick Douglass's birth. And if you don't know about Frederick Douglass, uh, Frederick Douglass, he, he freed himself from slavery. He became an abolitionist. He was a great orator. And he was also a photography theorist. He became one of the most photographed men in America and was known for his many portraits and lectures on photography. And so this image on the left is of the city of Rochester returning a new statue in its place. And then two young men attending a rally um, at the site. The portraits of my project, Come to Selfhood, were created in the likes of Frederick Douglass. The incident of the stolen statue made me think about how Frederick Douglass fought for the elevation of the African-American image beyond the derogatory, stereotypical image. And when we think about Frederick Douglass, we think about the positive portrayal of the African-American, one that he fought so hard to instill and to solidify in this country by taking and making so many self-portraits self-portraits that displayed himself in the way he wanted to be displayed and depicted, depicted. So during that month and that moment and during that week, I realized that there are still people who do not appreciate or do not acknowledge these positive identities of African-Americans. Uh, American society sometimes still uh, continues to disrespect not only the image of the African-American, but also the African-American hero and role model. So 
In 2014, I began to investigate how the vernacular image can be used to convey humanity, uh, specifically the image of the black father figure positioned as the role model. I realized that I could use the vernacular image to convey the humanity of black men and their role, uh, and their role models because it reflects on the family life. It reflects on the ordinary life, something to which everyone can relate. Vernacular photographs of African-American life are often missing from museum settings um, and popular media, but these images are very relevant because they depict common traditions, uh, values, cultures. They're essential objects that reveal both uh, the intimate and collective identities. And so we can use them to, and I use them to expose the narrative of black life, but also showing the joy and showing the beauty of the community. So here's a photo that also represents, you know, the in-between. Uh, we don't really know what's happening in this image but this man has a smile on his face and it allows us to simply appreciate the joy in his mundane. We have black men in the military. A young black man in the US Air Force enjoying a meal. We can see and understand that young African-American men also choose to fight for this country. It reminds me of the African-American men and women uh, that have fought and died in protection of a country that has refused them human and civil rights. Images of fathers embracing their young babies, the depiction of intimacy, the touch the embrace, uh, black fathers expressing affection, showing tenderness. And then we have one of my favorite images, the old finger in front of the lens. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a classic staple in family photography because everybody's passing around the camera. But the finger does not overpower what's going on behind this lens or in front of this lens. The father and the son connection. So I wanted to begin to use a collaborative approach to tell these stories of young black men asking them to provide an old image of their father figure from when their father was in his early 20s. Uh, sometimes you'll see images of grandfathers, however, and this is because I didn't want to exclude men um, from this project because their father figure may have been their grandfather or maybe an uncle. So here we have Raheem Pounds, and I want to say, you know, Raheem, you know, rest in peace. He passed away last year, unfortunately. And while doing this project, I found that these men had to go back and look for images in their, in their attic and maybe of their grandmother's house and maybe in an old shoebox. This is now becoming the act of mining the family archive, mining the personal archive, placing importance in these images. The young men end up learning so much about their history just from inquiring about the photograph many times that we don't look at, you know, we don't look at these images all the time. The young men would come and visit me to sit for a portrait, but only after we spend time talking about their experience, talking about their experience finding the photograph, and then answering questions about living in America, drawing the connections between their experiences and then their father figure's experiences, 
and asking questions like, well, who is the ideal figure or role model and why? I personally started to understand the cross-generational similarities in the black male experience during undergrad, which was 2008 through 2012 for me. And that's when I bought my first car. My dad helped me look for the car. It was an old 1994 Toyota Camry, and I bought it with my own money, and it was a proud moment for us. I drove the car back to Elizabeth City State University in North Carolina, all the way from Rochester, New York. I was driving one day with my friends in the car from college, going to a restaurant called Cookout in North Carolina. If anybody knows about that restaurant? OK, OK, good. So to get, to get food. And uh, I was unjustly pulled over at a stop sign. We were all pulled out of the car, and then we were put on the curb. My car was torn apart. More backup was called. And then canine units were called. And we were there on the curb for over an hour. And I had no idea what was going on. Finally, one of the officers, one of the officers came to me and told, told us to get up and get out of here. The officer that pulled me over initially came to me and whispered, you're lucky. This happened around October of that year, during the school year, and I didn't tell my parents immediately. I got home for a holiday break later that year, and I brought it up in one of our evening conversations, and I said, I got pulled over, and I was pulled out of the car. I saw a look on my mother's face, and I saw a look on my father's face that I'll never forget. My mother said, it's good that you got out of the car. But my father said, no, you shouldn't have gotten out of the car. And then they both began to argue with each other. Uh, and it was an intrigue interesting experience. They started to argue with each other about what should have happened and then what could have happened. Because as we see on the news, these situations can play out tragically and often for African American people. This instance is one that many black men and women understand and experience. And it's a conversation that black parents have to have. Uh, what do you do when you get pulled over? A thing you, or a thing, you know, we have to worry about every day when trying to complete a simple task, such as getting food or going to work or maybe going back to college in Texas or standing outside of a store or walking in your own neighborhood or walking home with Skittles and an Arizona iced tea. So this brings me to the handwritten text in Come to Selfhood, where young men are able to share their personal narrative openly. And when we begin to read these narratives together, you realize that there's a flow and there's also a common thread. And so when I collected the archival images of the father and paired them with contemporary portraits that I made of their sons, along with the collected handwritten narratives about experiences, the result is a collective story that you can't ignore. We identify with family. We identify with love, hardship, acceptance, rejection, triumph, 
reconciliation. And so when you hear the next few snippets of narratives, I'd like for you to think about how you identify with the man you see in this image here. Imagine them being your son, your father, or just your neighbor. We don't have to be related because we should love thy neighbor. That's what I was told as a young kid. We're all in this human race, so we should be able to do that. Come to selfhood. Every trail brings changes to his character. Every event evolves the nature of his soul. We are human, plain and simple. We cry, we laugh, we fight, we create, we love, we sympathize, we dream, just like the rest of the human race. But more often than not, people see us as violent, ignorant, criminals, loud, aggressive, as drug dealers, and that we trap. And these perceptions impact me every day. I'm automatically stereotyped because of my skin color. I don't see being black as a negative thing. For me, I get to be a part of a rich legacy of struggle and triumph. I'm part of one of the most creative groups of people on this planet. And I'm a real leader of change. To me, masculinity is a liquid. It's loose and easily manipulated. I love Andre 3000 because he exists within the hip hop world without selling himself to be the common rap icon. He has a strong sense of expression, undiluted by his surroundings. I like when men aren't afraid to show themselves. No, actually, the singer, Sylvester, though not likely the idealized version of black masculinity, Sylvester embodies what masculinity means to me. I was told by my father at a young age that I was a black man and my life would be harder because of it. I later understood that our world operates in symbols and labels. I watch people's first assumptions of me immediately disappear when I begin to speak. Perceptions cause people to look at me like I'm dumb or illiterate. So many people are surprised to hear how intellectual I am after taking time to get to know me. I don't believe there is an ideal figure of black male masculinity. Manliness is a series of qualities that we categorize into a particular group. No one can be 100% masculine. It's impossible. If anything, the black male who doesn't chase such ideals would ironically become the ideal figure. Masculinity is a phantom to me. I personally try to move towards it, but I can never fully grasp it.
I've had friends who've been physically beaten, harassed, and killed because of their true identity. Being black is one thing, but being black and queer poses a different topic of discussion. And I end with Jeremiah Thompson because it was an interesting moment for us. He's from Orlando, Florida, and he talks about how he identifies as a gay black man and how he used to be afraid for his life because of it. We made his photograph in June of 2016. And the night after we made his portrait, the mass shooting at the gay nightclub Pulse happened in Orlando. And he said to me that I could have been there. I had friends in there that died that night. So how does one begin to challenge the misguided perceptions that decrease the quality of living for African-American men? Furthermore, how does the African-American man position himself in a society uh, that continues to not acknowledge his true identity? African-American men and their stories of uh, intersecting, uh, intersecting identities are unrecognized in forms that allow these positive images to become a part of the, the dominant narrative of African-American men and American life. As a photographing artist, I choose contemporary portraiture, the vernacular image, qualitative data, and positioning to expose this narrative. And by delving into ideas of history, ideas of the role model, and varied experiences, Come to Selfhood begins to make the previously invisible black man accurately and meaningfully visible. And so after uh, the release of Come to Selfhood, I continue to explore this idea of black masculine identity and now gender. I started at Morehouse College back in Atlanta, Georgia an HBCU or historically black college or university. And it's also an all male school. So I was beginning not only to look at identity construction, but also at the fact that these men are coming to self within an institution known for developing historical conservative black uh, male leaders, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then them having to identify or not identify with that legacy. So the prompt for this section was, I am a man, a slogan from the sanitation worker strike in Memphis, Tennessee, that happened in 1968. And here's a portrait of one of the last uh, living sanitation strikers that I photographed for Smithsonian Magazine along with an image of himself in 1968. So it was interesting to see that along with Dr. King's assassination, after this last demonstration in Memphis, Tennessee, came the assassination of the slogan I am a man, along with the dwindling of the civil rights movement. Then traveling to Brooklyn, New York, uh, where a section of the uh, project was supported by uh, Photoville, Laura and Sam, thank you, um, where I began to strip down the portrait and allow more of the narrative to be present including the topic of I am a man, and additionally, notions of freedom. And if you look closely, that's Delon Burnside from Pose. He's now in that TV show. But he participated in this project um, and allowed us to 
read about his experiences with coming to self, but also his ideas on freedom. And so it's very interesting to see him now on a show that talks all about that. We got into an argument over, I think we was in like, we was in some type of um, health class. And some racist was brought up, you know what I'm saying? Race, I don't know, it was somehow brought up. Okay, and we had a, we had a disagreement, okay? But it didn't get heated until we left the class, until the class was over, you know what I'm saying? And we walked down the hall and the conversation continued. And I was like, I think I said something like, um, like people like people like her can't really like, they don't understand, they always see their point of view, like, you know what I'm saying? Like they really stuck in their ways. And then I said, it's not her fault because that's just the way she was raised. Like you can't help it. Like that's what she's been taught. And then she was like, yeah, blah, blah, I've been taught, blah, 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 that you're all niggers. <laughs> like, all of you are freaking <laughs> And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what? So we had, so check this out. That's not even the bad part. That's not even, because she's just some girl. So somebody, somebody heard, one of the, uh, I think <laughs> heard it. She was like mad. So, you know, she's white. She was like, that's messed up. So she went and told the teacher. And then the teacher went and like made us like have counseling together, me and the girl. We had, I had counseling together with the girl. So the first day of counseling, the counselor was like, straight up, sat us both down, was like, so you're mad at her because she called you a n I oh. said, oh. <laughs> what the f is going on? I said, what? I said, what? I said, what? And then she were like, steadily repeated it. Cause I'm shocked, once she said, I'm like, she's like, so she called you a n and you don't like being called the word And I said, I'm like, oh my God. Oh. So I just went along with it. I said, you know what, I'm mad as, I'm mad as hell right now. You know what I'm saying? I can't even think, I can't focus. I think I, man, I went home. I didn't want to tell my dad, because I know, you know my dad. Yeah. You know, you know my dad. And you know, he was the president of the NAACP at the time. So he was really in Man, <laughs> man, I did yeah. not want to tell my dad. I, I went, I was going to let him off easy. I went and told my mom. Uh, my mom told my dad. My dad had woke me up, cause you know, he was working nights. My dad woke me up like, hey, tell me what happened. <laughs> he was mad, he was mad as hell. He's like, tell me what happened. So I told him what happened. That next morning, he came in, had a meeting. I'm talking about, he, he had a meeting with the, the head principal, the superintendent, and the counselor, all in the room, same room. And he brought my grandma, everything. Like, you know, <laughs> and you know my dad, he, he went in there snapping, like acting like, showing, he was acting like, you know. <laughs> he had them all scared. He's like, Mr. Cruz, calm down, sir, please. We're under we understand. He's like, I want that counselor, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I want that um him to have a new counselor. I want her to be and I want to know her punishment, blah blah blah, all that. That's the first one. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. So really, that's just that's just how it is, you know. I mean, how it is living in this it. world. You know what I'm saying? That's how it is living in this world. That's just how it is. And so, the one, uh, this is actually my younger brother here on the, on the left. No, on the right. I guess, well, my right. <laughs> um, and one of his best friends. And they were both 15 years old when I first began this project. And now they're 21. And I made these portraits just last month. And now I'm asking them the same questions. And now you're able to hear the conversations that happen when I conduct this project beyond just the written narrative. Here we finally see the generational aspect of this project, of this project playing out in real time. The father figure, the mother and the grandmother have to step in to correct a race issue that happened in a high school after adults at the high school failed to handle the situation correctly. These same problems that our heroes such as Frederick Douglass dealt with uh, and our role models like our mothers and fathers and our elders like our grandmothers and our grandfathers have dealt with in the 30s, in the 40s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 
and now in 2019. Who honestly needs to make the progress is the question I'd like to pose to all of you. I see a need for this project to continue, which is why I return home to Rochester, New York to do that in a place where I came to self, but left and realized more about this world. The work has been published as a very, uh, very limited edition artist book uh, that already sold out in two years ago. Uh, and it didn't reach that many people. But I would like to see this work reach a wide variety of audiences and homes in the near future, because there's still, still so much work to be done and still so much to learn. Thank you.